Jamila Martins. In South Africa, the police and the prosecution service are two distinct and separate institutions. Yet they must rely on each other if they are to succeed in their fight against crime. A perfectly investigated crime will not lead to a conviction if its prosecution is flawed. Equally, a flawless prosecution will lead to an acquittal if the if if accused and the police have not uncovered sufficient evidence to allow the prosecution to prove its case beyond reasonable doubt. In essence, one weak link in the criminal justice process is all that is required for it to fail. The events of the last two weeks accused Zanuku Klimbata in the sense of Meriwa murder case and Tamsa Ngatwala in the Tegan Morris murder case released due to insufficient evidence. Today on Rights and Recourse, we take a closer look at this dichotomy. Joining us in today's topic arm is Brenda Wardle, Chief Operations Officer from the Wardle College of Law. Brigadier Neville Malila will join us later, spokesperson for the Houghton South African Police Service and Pastor Hein April, Committee Leader from Raja Park. But before we get into our discussion, let us listen to this insert. The National Prosecuting Authority says a case against him would be difficult, if not impossible, to prove. Zamogu Shembata wants to sue the state. Afraid of a backlash, he says police have ruined his life. I'm afraid for my life. Many people are still angry over Mayiwa's killing. When his lawyer was asked if a lawsuit is on the cards, I will be looking at that, but it will also depend on the instructions from the family, because I will advise them what to do from here. We have Earlier Mbata was vindicated when Magistrate Daniel Tulare ordered his release. This court orders the immediate release of the accused Zamagutle innocent Mbata from detention. His family have conflicting emotions and saddened that he was arrested in the first place. We are happy. Our relative is free. We were tired of the lies. Other family members inconsolable and the media attention also too much. We were not satisfied that, you know, uh, it will be fair and just to continue with the matter when we ourselves have so many questions around the identification parade, around the evidence that was gathered from the scene. A week ago, police were adamant they caught one of the suspects. We are sure that the person that we have now charged is one of the suspects that were involved in the incident. Well, now the police have egg on their faces. Initially, they boldly proclaimed that they'd arrested one of the suspects responsible for the murder of Senzo Meiwa. And now their case seems to be in tatters, perhaps underlining the severe pressure they were under to produce a suspect. But what now for the police? We've always said that we're looking for between three and four suspects. So obviously the person uh, against whom the charges have been provisionally withdrawn is, was, uh, was in any case not the only person. So the investigation is still continuing. Among the millions of South Africans still looking for answers and justice is the Mayiwa family. I'm very hurt by the court decision. I'm hoping the real culprits will be caught. Police are back to square one as ordinary citizens clamor for justice and closure. Criselda Lewis, SABC News, on Gauteng's East Strand. Well, thank you to Criselda Lewis there. Lady and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Good afternoon, good afternoon. thank In you. In the absence of Brigadier Nav Malila, he's going to join us later, but I want to ask this question. We started with it right at the beginning in the introduction of our program. The relationship between the prosecution and the police in making a case that can go to court. Well, it, it is important for me to state, Dumile, at the onset that uh, remember that the police, the prosecution and correctional services are part of the triad that uh, forms the security cluster. The police are simply there to investigate crimes and to open up case dockets 
where in their view there is a prima facie case or where there is an allegation of, of wrongdoing. Immediately they are done with the docket. If they are satisfied that the complainant has, has brought in sufficient evidence to justify the opening of a criminal case, it is then sent to the National Prosecuting Authority. And the National Prosecuting Authority is dominus litis, or they are masters of the suite. Now immediately they receive that docket. The prosecutor can't just sit back and say, I accept the say-so of the South African Police Service. The prosecutor is under an obligation to go through that docket to establish whether or not there is a case. If it is apparent, even at that early stage, that there is no case, the, national, uh, the prosecutor has a right to withdraw those charges through the control prosecutor and the uh, system of seniority. Oh, and apparently this is what happened in the Tegan Morris case. Um, we are really, uh, look, we, I'm not a legal expert, but I can tell you from where we are sitting as normal community members, it makes no sense. It makes no sense that someone can be positively identified by a victim and then that person gets, don't even appear in court, that person is just released and free to go before that person says anything in court. For us as community members who don't understand your legal terms and all of those things, none of these things make sense. And it brings a anger outside, out of people who, uh, because there is no one that comes to us to explain exactly how these things happen. I can tell you from where we are sitting that we, we as community members are extremely angry because we don't understand this, uh, uh, or the, mech the mechanics or the politics of our legal system. Let, let, let me go. Let me hold, let's hold it there. We will ask some of the questions from Brigadier Neville. Malila. But Brenda, the, yes. the one question here is, there is a, a, a bit of confusion. I'm also confused yes. whether charges have been dropped or the case has been dismissed. What's the difference between the two? Well, there's a big difference. The one is where the National Prosecuting Authority decides we are declining to prosecute this case. And then they withdraw the case and they decline to prosecute. The second one is where an accused person has appeared in court but hasn't pleaded. Immediately that person hasn't pleaded to the charges. Any withdrawal that takes place after he or she has appeared in court is then a provisional withdrawal of the matter. Now the presiding officer who is the magistrate or the judge might even ask, on what grounds are you withdrawing these charges? Is it because there's insufficient evidence or is it on the merits? That, that, so those are the two instances where, and that's totally different to an acquittal where an accused person goes through a trial and is then subsequently found not guilty and discharged or even found guilty and then convicted and sentenced. The magistrate, for, well, we've seen many cases where the prosecutors ask for more time for investigation in a case, probably just look at the docket and found that there's not enough evidence yes. to, for a prosecution. And the magistrate can then say, no, guys, take this case out of my court and come back to me once you've got all the evidence. Right. Now, the, the, the rights or the role of the magistrate, this is, remember, this is a, a discretionary prosecutorial model first. So the National Prosecuting Authority use their discretion based on the evidence available. But the magistrate doesn't really play a key role prior to the trial itself, except, as you correctly point out, in instances where cases are postponed, the magistrate can say, if the defense even argues, look, we've had several postponements in this case. It doesn't seem to be continuing. So what will actually happen is that we will ask for a final postponement so that if the state is not ready to proceed, then the charges can be withdrawn. But the role of the magistrate is a very, very limited one. He he acts on the direction of uh, the prosecutor who, as I said, is Dominus Littis in this matter. If you'd like to join us in today's discussion, please call us on 714-5497 or 5498 or tweet us at Rights and Recourse or email us at Rights at sabc.co.za. We will be joined when we come back by Brigadier Neville Malila, who will give us a bit of a background to all of these two cases that we are dealing with today.
GovTech is South Africa's premier ICT event hosted by CETA. Our theme for GovTech 2014 is a government empowered by technology. Our topics will explore e-government, infrastructure and broadband, reducing the cost of ICT and service delivery, best practice, innovation and success stories. Join us at the Durban ICC on 2nd to 5th November 2014. Register now on www.govtech.co.za. smartphone takes superior photos even in low light, has PlayStation 4 remote play and up to two days battery life. Don't settle for good, demand great. The new Sony Xperia Z3 series. Welcome back. We have now been joined by Brigadier Neville Malila from the South African Police in Gauteng. This week, Tegra Morris suspect was acquitted. Let us take a look at this inset and hear what the committee had to say. Shame! Justice system, shame! 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 We are asking this was the feeling among members of the Reche Park community. Shortly after learning that charges against the suspect in the Tegra Morris murder had been dropped, we have decided to withdraw all the charges against the accused Kamsanu Kuala in absentia. The charges are accordingly withdrawn and the accused will be released from detention with immediate effect. And after court proceedings, tensions ran high. The community demanding an explanation. We were in court for two minutes and we didn't hear anything why these charges were drawn. As we are standing here as a community, we want to know why is the charges, all charges dropped against this gentleman. It is the same thing that has happened now with Senzo. That case might be withdrawn against him. That case is not withdrawn against him in heaven. We pray for a loving God. Meanwhile, charges were withdrawn allegedly due to discrepancies in evidence. This means the killers of Tegran Morris are yet to face justice. Stefina Komani, SABC News, Boxburg. Well, thank you, Stefina Kumani. Uh, we have been joined by Brigadier Neville Malila. Brigadier, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Good afternoon. Uh, Brigadier, we are aware, uh, probably let me start by saying, I became a little bit confused, I asked Brenda this question earlier, as to whether the charges have been dropped or dismissed. And everybody is a little bit confused. If you can put the record straight. I think I've, uh, I've listened to part of Brenda, uh, Brenda's response. Um, there is a difference be between acquittal, the provisional withdrawal, and the withdrawal of charges. Um, in the two cases, we, we, we're dealing with um, a provisional withdrawal, meaning when, um, when a case is provisionally withdrawn, the, the, the suspect is not totally off the hook. It's basically the prosecution authority um, say to the police or to the investigation team, there are certain, uh, there are certain issues that, needs to be, uh, that need to be looked at. For instance, it can be discrepancies that they've picked up in, in, in the consultation process. And that, um, that was the case in the Tegra and Morris um, um, incident. There, was, uh, the, there were discrepancies that they've picked up during, uh, during the consultation process. And um, then the prosecution authority felt that um, it, it, it is um, in the interest of justice and the interest of, um, of the suspect to, to, to provisionally withdraw the charges and afford the, and, and, and afford the, uh, the investigation 
an opportunity to do further investigation in the matter. Now, if, if this case is still continuing, and these two gentlemen might be called back or rearrested, uh, are the identikits issued by the police after the murder of Senzo Mayor still relevant, or are we satisfied that the police had been interviewing the correct people, including Barta, and, uh, or should the public still be on the lookout? Yeah, in, um, in, the Senzo, uh, in the Senzo matter, we've indicated that we're looking for at least between three and four suspects. The ID kits that were drawn up, remember ID kits are being drawn up by information and input that comes from, um, uh, from witnesses uh, that, that's been interviewed by the investigation team. So those, uh, those two ID kits, uh, they, they are still relevant, and our appeal is still out there for the community to come forward with information that can assist us. We have received um, lots and lots of information, and the investigation team worked through um, all the pieces of information that, um, the, that we received but that didn't, uh, that didn't assist us to make any arrest in that matter. How do we, probably all of you can come into this question, Brenda and uh, Brigadier. The question I wanted to know is, I know in the judicial system there's a case management file and don't we have an evidence management system in the police when we investigate a case? Yeah, there is, a, there, there is a evidence uh, or case management um, a process between the, the police and the, ju the judiciary. What normally happens is, for instance, when the, police, um, in, in, uh, when the police investigate this case, they go to the, uh, to the prosecuting authority before they place the docket on the court roll, normally for consultation. And um, in, in, in the Senzo matter, that consultation took place uh, uh, the, the Friday afternoon before the case was, was withdrawn. And uh, the prosecution authority on the Friday afternoon decided to place the matter uh, to place the matter on the court roll and the matter was postponed for a week for the investigation team uh, to do certain investigations and uh, um, at the next uh, at, at the next court appearance the case was provisionally withdrawn now um, in, in in basically in both um, in both cases we we also have to do with um, um, some of the evidence that that went to the for the um, to the lab for analysis, and especially in the Senzo case, we're still waiting for some of those um, for, for some of those reports to, to come back and assist us further in the investigation. Dominic, can can I just come in and say uh, my my concerns? I think are on both sides, and uh, the Reverend alluded to that fact earlier that. Uh, you know, communities don't really understand these processes. And, and I know exactly what he's talking about because I come from originally from Park Ridge in East London, which is a former mm. colored area, which is very, very mm. rough. And what happens in the courts, you need to come back and explain to people mm. that, look, there are certain procedures. The Criminal Procedure Act is there to basically guide this. But my concern uh, around both matters arises from the fact that, and, and, and I think uh, that Brigadier, uh, the police must also be, you know, very wary. I think we understand that the public pressure mm. is so enormous that you are almost forced uh, to, to make an arrest in order to quell that anger that is, that is out there. And I think that is where the errors basically come in. The second thing is, even with witnesses, and I think SAPS should make it clear to people who, who give uh, statements to them, that look, whatever you've told the police, you need not go out into the media. A week after Senzo Meiwa uh, was, was murdered, in the Sunday Times, there was one article, Kelly Kumalo saying, this is how it happened. In another, I think it's the mm. Sunday Sun, um, it, 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 it was a Twala different. saying something different. Now, these statements that they make will possibly be used at a subsequent mm. trial. Mm. And mm. with such, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's controversial. What they were saying doesn't add up, you know. So, so the one person says, this is how it happened. The other one says, that is how it happened. And you ask yourself, why are there different versions? And I mean, I've said this previously, even when we've discussed Oscar's case, that when there's the truth, there need mm. not be versions. Mm. If there were seven people in that house, even though their statements can never be exactly the mm. same, Dumile, there must be a common thread. Mm. Uh, you know, that, that is I, the I problem. If, before you answer that question, I want to ask you a question first, uh, Pastor April. You, have, you were trying to calm the people on, was it Friday or Thursday? It was on Friday. On Friday, yes. when you said, if people take the law into their own hands, we cannot stop them. Does this frustration uh, with these 
are they are they so deep these frustrations you must understand we are the face of our communities we are the people who speak to our communities we are the people that continually interact with our communities we ask the people to be calm at the end of the day these people will turn against us because of the mishaps that's happening in the justice system one thing that i just want to bring in before i i i, I forget this the police ask us as community members to help and when help arrives like Chantel morris was the lady who was uh, hijacked she is the mother of tigran morris she remembers the gentleman that has placed that gun in her face and who drove off with her gti with her son screaming mommy help me she will never ever forget the face of the perpetrator that's what she said to us Chantel morris is the only credible witness that can be believed when an identity parade takes place. No matter whether you take a Apart thousand she men. She pointed out Twala in an identity parade. Positively identified Twala in identity parade. Now you must understand, we were called into the court to be explained how an identity parade works. That does make no sense for us because the lady that is the victim positively identified Mr. Twala. And the police say, through, uh, said, uh, the, uh, I mean the NPA said to us, uh, the, the process was flaunted when they did the identity parade. For us, that holds no water. Let me go to Brigadier Malila. Brigadier, apparently in, on that case, apparently it was said the investigating officer was present when this identification was done and he must not be supposed not to be present. Am I wrong? The, the, the investigating officer must not take part. You know, he can, be, he can be in the vicinity, but he must not take part in the, um, in the processes. The... Uh, the I.O. did not take part um, in the identification parade and, and the process. He did not. The, um, obviously, uh, the, the evidence, I cannot discuss the content uh, of the case as mm. uh, that must ultimately mm. uh, be tested um, in the court of law. The, um, there were other issues during the consultation process that um, the NPA was of the view that it is much better at this stage to withdraw the case because of the discrepancies um, during the identification parade and some of the witness statements that's um, that, that's in the document. But you must remember, but, but you must remember, even when you when you, you when you're saying to us the NPA made the decision, that gentleman when he was arrested, mm. it was shared with us that he was involved in another hijacking and there was a, a unlicensed firearm found with him and there was a stolen car that was in his in his in his in his uh, possession. Now he's free. Not any of the other charges have even been brought. Uh, he wasn't even charged for any of the other things. How does this police work? The, um, the, the, the other charges, the other charges, still under investigation. Still under yeah, all those still, charges. All those other charges. Uh, are still want to say something yes, quickly? I, I just wanted to come in I and like say the the, uh, the the identity uh, parade, and I think Brigadier is going to agree with me here. Those are formal matters, mm. formal procedural mm. matters that must be adhered to. Mm. And that is why we can speak about botched investigations. Our law is very, very clear, and that is unfortunate because fair trial rights demand that the processes be followed to the latter. Because if a procedural uh, 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 aspect is not done correctly, then it can lead to the acquittal Quittal, yeah. of someone yeah. who is actually guilty, who has actually done that. But because the formal and the procedural aspects have not been complied with, that happens. But However, let me add that, that when there are such instances where they say this evidence, the evidence of the ID parade, for example, is inadmissible. There are instances where even the Constitutional Court has said that sometimes it is in the interests mm. of justice mm. that evidence which has been unconstitutionally obtained has mm. to be mm. admitted. Mm. And that is what could, in my view, have happened. I don't know mm. the facts, so we'll I'm saying that, that we'll on, on a limited way. As we go mm. on, yes. if you'd yes. like you. to join us on today's discussion, please call Call us on 011-714-5497 or 5498 or tweet us at Rights Recourse or email us if you have anything you want us to discuss at Rights and Recourse at sabc.co.za. We'll be back after the break.
smartphone takes superior photos even in low light. Has PlayStation 4 remote play and up to two days battery life. Don't settle for good. Demand great. The new Sony Xperia Z3 series. Enjoy your PlayStation 4 games on your smartphone with PS4 Remote Play. Don't settle for good, demand great. The new Sony Xperia Z3 series. Get the new Sony Xperia Z3 on a My MTN Choice 100 contract for only $4.99 and get a free 12-month music streaming subscription. Welcome back. Uh, Pastor April, I know you are, you are burning to say something, but let's first take this call from Namibia, from Cam, Camrad or Camuela. I'm not sure what's your name. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Uh, hello, sir. How are you doing? Sir? Fine, thanks. How are you? That is good. I also want to contribute a little bit uh, about the, 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 the incident that happening in South Africa. Yes. So. Uh, man, I also worried about the investigation that they made by the police because sometimes the information that they are getting from the community, they tend to ignore sometimes and that they do not have any concrete other additional information to investigate the case. And they are always asking the help from the community, but the help they get it from the community, they don't utilize it in the way that they are getting to, to, to conclude and to make a solution to the problem that, that is there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Cameron. This is our regular caller from Namibia. Brigadier, I know uh, there are processes in which you weigh evidence that you get or weigh information that you get from anybody. You do the same with evidence you get from the communities. Yes, we do. But, um, we do. Remember, that, um, if we use this as a basis, the two cases that, um, that's under discussion now. Um, when we ask community members for, uh, for assistance or for, um, for help, um, in both cases we have teams, um, teams of, of, um, of detectives investigating this. And all the bits and pieces of investigation, we have uh, some of our um, experts that normally go to the scene and do reconstruction, scene reconstructions. And that ultimately guides the whole process of the investigation. And um, sometimes you get small bits and pieces of information that helps the police to fill in, you know, the puzzle. Ultimately, um, fill in the puzzle and get uh, and get to your perpetrators. Father Ayn April, oh, Pastor Ayn April, you uh, wanted to say something earlier. You were burning to say something. Yo, the flame just got higher. I heard what, what was said now about the teams of detectives that, that is placed on these high-profile cases. When you talk about teams of detectives and you look at the, high, the profile of the cases that we are talking about today, you will understand that I suppose that the best policemen are taken for these uh, specific cases in order to investigate them. Then my question now becomes, if we're looking at the formal procedural aspects that uh, was being referred to earlier, how can our best police slip up on these formal aspects? That means then there would be a fundamental problem then bigger than what we anticipated. What is the competency level then now of our best when they flaw, uh, when they make mistakes with the formal procedural aspects of any of, of, of such a case. Well, uh, just before that question is answered, perhaps, I just want to ask this question, Brigadier. When, after an identity parade, when do you, when do you decide to make an arrest? Oh, uh, you've, you've had the identicates, then we have an identity parade. Uh, when do you decide to make an arrest? The, many a times when you do an identi identification parade, you already, you've already made an arrest or you have a possible, a possible suspect. Now, when you, have, uh, when you have one suspect in a case and he is to appear in an identification parade, there must be, there must be eight to ten people um, who are that suspect on the identification parade. And um, the, the, some of the normal or the procedural aspect that uh, Pastor Hein is referring to is, for instance, it must be people that look very similar to you um, as, as the description of the, sus, uh, of the suspect um, were or was in, um, in a specific case. Then uh, that person is placed, he or she can decide 
um, where he wants to stand in the process, in, in the identification um, parade. We use, um, we, we, we use uh, the, the mirrored glass where, the, the, for instance, the suspects can't see who the witnesses are. Um, uh, witnesses witnesses won't, uh, won't be able to discuss with each other. You take them from one side after identification. You take them out on, a, uh, on another end of the... Another, that, 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 to that's another part, door. To another door. That's okay. uh, part of the formal uh, procedures during an identification parade and when a suspect has been identified by any of the witnesses that suspect is then immediately ar um, arrested um, he can then be charged and brought before the court after the process uh, now Brenda will tell you after the process that um, th that evidence or the pr th everything that's been collected there will then be discussed and placed before the NPA who finally makes the decision remember the police don't decide to, uh, that we take this docket, we place we place it on the court room. The prosecuting uh, the prosecuting authority decides after the evidence has been presented to them. Yes, we have enough now to charge the person and bring him to court. Even um, if if they feel before the first appearance that there isn't enough evidence to place that docket uh, or to place the suspect. Um, on the court roll, they will say, no, there's not enough evidence, you can release the person. Uh, or it can go that there is a, a withdrawal or provisional withdrawal on what, the, uh, on the matter. What I would uh, like to add quickly to that is that remember that with an ID parade, it's not only suspects who are lined up. So they can take any other number of people mm. who match the suspect. And there has to be a link between the ID parade and other pieces of evidence already available. Yeah. Otherwise, if, if people make errors in certain instances, so if I were to join an ID parade and I wasn't part, I was just asked, come, would you stand with all these other women? And somebody comes back and says, well, that is the person. They cannot place me under arrest because it would not be the person yeah. that they are looking for in that lineup. And, and I think that is, uh, is also very, very important for yeah. people to understand. Isn't it true, before for, uh, Pastor April you come in, I just want to find, isn't it true, even in, a, in a, an identification parade, there should be evidence that correlates with the person who we are looking for in this parade? Yes, there should be there should be there evidence, be an and as I said, normally the person, uh, the, the the possible suspect, would have been in custody already. So whoever um, conducts the ID parade would know that this is the possible suspect, but he or she must be positively um, identified on a, an ID parade. For instance, you don't have a name of a person, you can only give a description. And th that is when a witness must then be able to identify that specific person on an ID parade in order for us to charge the person. And that's the difficulty in the sense of Meiwa one, where this person, Mbata, is someone who was known to both Meiwa and Kumalo. And obviously, if somebody who washes your car comes into your house and holds you up at gunpoint, it wouldn't have been that three or whatever number of unknown gunmen walked in. They would have said, this person is actually required because he already at that stage mm. of the commission of the crime would have been, um, would have been known. Look, I just have one question before I, before I uh, make my, 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 my next comment. Um, when, whose responsibility is it during the 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 ident to, to put together the similar suspects when you say mr twala in this case is being arrested and he's one of the people standing in the identity parade is it the police who goes out and look for the other people who look similar to him or is it is he the person that decides take these other people who chooses no it would be the police uh, it's the police that decide for instance the police would look for other suspects that's in custody or they can even get uh, suspects in custody from adjacent police stations or they can take members of the community we sometimes can even take a member um, a, a member of the police that is of similar height or similar complexion and place them in plain clothes on an ID parade. Brigadier, let's take this call. So, sorry, Pastor. Let's take this call from Chabalala from the Free State. Good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Yes, that is Chabalala Maliwa. Yes, how are you, sir? I'm fine, Daniel. Well, thank you. What is your, what is your question? My question here, I'm raising a problem here in the Free State. Yes, go ahead. We listen. Yeah. The, my problem is the, the, I bought a car. 
the, the quantum uh, car. No, 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 Mr. 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 Chabalala, we are very sorry. We are we sympathize with you. We will listen to your story at some other time, but we are busy here with some. There's the one thing I want to go back to this uh, Tegan Morris thing. Apparently, the guys took the car. The way is the car? Was the car found? Where are the fingerprints to the car and all of those things? The, the, in the in, in the Tegran Morris, uh, remember the car was the, the car was found approximately two uh, two three kilometers um, away. The the fingerprints we we've collected fingerprints. We had our experts. There's um, forensic analysis that's uh, that that's been collected. Now later on, when you make arrest, those are some of the evidence that will assist you in um, in identifying a positive a, a positive suspect or. Um, when a suspect is arrested, we will use those evidence when it gets to the court case to, to match up with the suspect. We understand uh, you want to say something earlier. Let's say Mr. Twala is not the suspect and Mr. Twala has been wrongfully charged by the police. You must understand the way that Reicher Park is on fire right now. If Mr. Twala can be seen by any of community members, his life has been there for now placed in danger. Because you must understand that this man, we have already seen his face, we know what he looks like, and we know where he lives. And the problem that with, with that is, this man's la life is in danger before he even gets a chance to explain his side of the story uh, uh, in a, and, and, and be tested in a court of law. That is the danger that we are sitting with now. That is why we need people like yourself, Pastor, to calm down the communities. You, we can calm them as much as we can. But you must understand that we must also come to a point where we ask those that we place in authority to take, uh, to take responsibility for the actions that we have entrusted them to, to, to do. We understand there's a meeting tomorrow night. Yes, tomorrow evening there's a, a serious meeting where we need the police. We, uh, uh, there, uh, Brigadier Malila, we need you to come and give feedback to our community. What is it? Tomorrow night, 6 o'clock in Reicha Park, we are having this meeting. And we need them to come and explain to our community what is the processes and why Mr. Twala was uh, um, set free of and, this charge. And that is why it, it becomes critically important for arrests only to be made when at least there's a prima facie case where you don't just go out, even if the police do have uh, information, as I'm sure mm. they have in both these cases, mm. where you first take all those, all that information, collate it and say, ah, uh -uh, here we might end up in trouble. Because if, if a person is wrongfully arrested or even maliciously prosecuted, mm. they can go ahead and sue Hello. the state. Mm. And mm. we've seen how much the police have lost just this past year of, from, from lawsuits, from lawsuits arising we'll, we'll, from wrongful arrest. We'll explore this issue of uh, wrongful arrest and malicious prosecution. But I just want to go to one place. We, we now have two people with Mbata whose life is now in danger because he's been identified. We have uh, Twala whose life is in danger, we have been identified. We have also Mrs. Chantal Morris who identified Twala in a parade. How do we deal with these things? Yeah, as you've earlier on said, um, you know, the, the, from the police side, we've asked, uh, we've, we've also called for calm. Uh, we've asked uh, community leaders and the CPF and uh, community structures to assist us in, 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 in quelling the tension that is um, in, the, in the various communities and allow the police and the prosecu uh, prosecution authority uh, to, you know, to, to continue and finalize the investigation. Um, it, because we know that uh, the, the process of justice is normally not a short process. And we want to, um, as Brenda earlier, uh, earlier on said, we want to tie all the loose, um, all the loose ends so that we can um, get to a successful prosecution. Dear, I, we have another call on the line. We have Zeluvuya on the line. Zeluvuya, good afternoon and welcome to Rights and Recourse. Hello there, sir. Yes, how are you? I'm well, and yourself? Well, thank you. What's your question? Okay, my question is one, especially when it comes to the police and the law of this country. No? The problem is one, like this guy who was arrested now with regards to sense of murder. He was found with illegal firearm, illegal ve uh, uh, vehicle, which is a stolen vehicle. No? But now I've got a problem. Okay, I'm not a law expert. I'm just a normal person of this country. Yes. You're telling me, I, I want to talk, actually, I, I specifically want to, 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 to pose this question, especially to that law lady there, says that uh, 
you come to this person who's got illegal firearm, he's got a ille- uh, uh, stolen vehicle, and you're telling me you are investigating. Why are you investigating if you find this person is a criminal person and you are investigating? Why are you investigating? You Thank want you to investigate much, something. Let us, let us. If, if you investigate, you investigate something you don't know. But now you find this person with this particular... I I'm not saying he, he made it a sense, though, but now the, the charges of the illegal firearm and the stolen vehicle are investigated. But he was found with those things. What thank, you, thank, you, you. thank you very much. We've, we've got your question. Uh, we will respond to that question yes. after the break. If you still would like to call us like Zuluvu, you can call us on double one seven one four five four nine seven 5497 or 5498 at straight and at 5498 or oh, we'll be back after the break. But before we go, we would like to cross over to Studio 9 where the service at the Waterkloof Air Base will be taking place for the mortal remains of South Africans who were returned to South Africa from Nigeria this morning. But rights and recourse does continue and those who are following this program can follow us tonight at 10 o'clock. The full program will be uh, aired and tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock in the morning. the media has then fully unpacked of what these strikes could possibly do to the economy if it's going to that extent of a recession. It doesn't mean that when we solve the mining strike that suddenly the GDP is going to go on increase and we're all going to go and have an economic Very boom. True, so yes. we, we've got to go and look at that fact as well. Obviously the media um, you know, can't touch on absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a very complicated situation. Watch Media Monitor with me, Alicia Jali, Sundays at 9am only on the SABC News Channel. SABC News delivers stories that unify the nation in many ways. Stories that inspire us to see the world differently, appreciate and celebrate our diversity. And mostly, they make this place a better country to live in despite our color, beliefs or culture. I. 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 I am. Mahendra Raghunath. Yevinyat. Tabile Wadu. Lulu Gabu. Join us every day as we provide updates on local and international news straight into your home. We. We, we are. We are SABC News. Well, it's a very good afternoon, and if you're just joining us, a warm welcome to this uh, special live uh, broadcast uh, on the formal reception ceremony for the 74 South Africans that died in Nigeria just uh, two months ago. I am Aubrey Mpofu. Now, the bodies of uh, the 74 South Africans killed in the Nigeria church collapse have now arrived in South Africa just over two months after the incident. Now, families received the bodies of their loved ones at the Vatterkloof Air Force Base in Pretoria this morning. A total of 116 people died on the 12th of September when a guest house belonging to the Synagogue Church of All Nations in Lagos, headed by the preacher TB Joshua, collapsed. We now cross live to the Vatterkloof Air Force Base in Pretoria, where a memorial service is currently taking place. And we say good afternoon to SABC contributing editor, Vuyomboko, good afternoon. It must be a somber mood in Pretoria this morning, this afternoon, rather. 
Well, it is indeed, and thanks very much um, uh, for joining us live from the Vatterkloof Air Force Base, where uh, for the next couple of hours we'll be bringing you live that ceremony, the official ceremony where um, the mortal remains of those people who died tragically um, in Nigeria will be received here, an official ceremony that, of course, uh, Deputy President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa will be giving that uh, keynote address. Welcome to this special broadcast brought to you by SABC News. My name is uh, Vuyam Vogo, but I'm not alone. Thank you very much, Vuyo, and I'm Chris Alda Lewis. Thank you very much uh, to the viewers for joining us. Uh, certainly, we'll be bringing you all the live coverage from here. We know that uh, the families of the 74 uh, uh, South Africans who died have arrived here at uh, the Vatrakloof Air Force Base, and certainly what's to be a very sad day here in South Africa. But also uh, giving hope here today, these remains we know have been stuck in Lagos in Nigeria for the past uh, over two months right now. So certainly, uh, lots of closure that is needed by these families for you, for them to bury their loved ones and uh, certainly what we're expecting the Deputy President to say of course again is to uh, send those condolences once again to the families of those affected and uh, also as we've heard from government officials that we spoke to earlier saying that there needs to be something or someone needs to take responsibility for what has happened in Lagos in Nigeria. Well you were here Chris Alda. Yep. I mean, so you've been here since like um, wee hours of the morning um, really and you were here I remember I mean I was in studio when uh, the 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 um, the air, the, the um, that um, aeroplane touched down uh, bringing those remains back if you can just take our viewers back um, to that moment when that um, plane landed it's essentially if we are what we've been waiting for uh, for the past uh, uh, two and a half, um, uh, not two and a half, but slightly over two months, when the South African government, of course, had announced that those bodies would return to South Africa. There's a lot of skepticism regarding if that was to be the case, but certainly the minister in the presidency, Chef Khadebe, could not return empty-handed. What were you going to say to the families of these loved ones? But when that plane did touch down, certainly, you know, um, a very somber mood, but somewhat um, for many who had been gathered here saying finally this needed to happen. This is one of the worst disasters to ever happen uh, to a place of worship. So when those remains came through and um, we saw the first truck, the first of the four trucks coming out of uh, the um, aircraft, certainly you could, there was a lot of silence that had uh, you know engulfed this entire area so really really difficult but the first point of closure that will be reached for the Sam family certainly just speaking i mean you spoke to uh, many of the ministers who have been involved including minister khadebe including uh, of course the minister of social development as well as the minister of health um just i know there's there's diplomacy yes. and um, ministers find it difficult to actually say it for what it is but uh, did you get some a sense of frustration on their part as to in fact with regard to the fact that this took so long we took so long to get where we are today oh absolutely that's certainly what i picked up from the ministers that uh, you know that we spoke to by the ministers indicating that uh, first of all the minister in the presidency jeff khadebe when i asked him about the ties between south africa and nigeria and he said well everything is fine but there had been an element of frustration because south africa certainly needed to abide to the rules and regulations in that country and th there needed to be a, a rescue operation that needed to take place. There were so many things that needed to be done before we reached the point of repatriation. But this, this, there is the diplomacy, but uh, frustration, but a sense of relief. Uh, that I got from them certainly this morning stating that it's been a long time coming there was no way they could return to South Africa empty-handed and this process needed to, to happen and happen soon saying that the cooperation as well from Nigeria has been spot on uh, despite uh, you know uh, speculation that there might be problems between South Africa and Nigeria as a result of this delay but uh, uh, all that being downplayed certainly by the South African government. Now close to 90 um, officials drawn from uh, across Across um, the state from the health department, home affairs, uh, international relations and so on. Um, do they give us a sense of just how difficult or easy it was for them now to play their part once the formal negotiations, state to state to state um, negotiations were concluded? Oh certainly, these are really the unsung heroes and heroines of those who participated in this mass repatriation process. Uh, we saw a bunch of tired uh, uh, 
professionals from across uh, the spectrum are getting off that uh, a, a flight after hours and hours of work and uh, you know DNA specialists uh, some from the health department as well and you know the sense that they're giving us was that to see that devastation and destruction not only affects the families who will for the first time here today uh, see, not, not, not physically, because the bodies of course will not be shown, will not be viewed at all, but uh, the sense that we're getting is that the devastation and the, the destruction is far more worse than what we have been seeing on television. It's, it, it's been emotional for them as well, to such a degree that uh, counselling perhaps would need to be given to these individuals who participated in this repatriation process. Certainly that's the indication we got from the Minister in the Presidency, Jeff Khadebe, who says he was blown away by what he saw, referring of course to the devastation and the destruction. Now one of the things we are told is going to be difficult, I mean uh, um, the people who have lost their family members in this tragedy um, have been asked or are being implored not to view the bodies because I mean you can imagine two months um, in less than uh, perfect um, conditions right. in those um, Nigerian morgues. Um, did you get a sense that the families Obviously, they will not be happy, but do they understand why this is so? In other words, they will not be able to view the bodies of their loved ones. Well, that was the main bone of contention, I understand, between a meeting that was held with the, the Social Development Minister, Batabile Lamini, when she met with these families yesterday at the various hotels where they have been staying uh, in the run-up to the ceremony we're having today. And they were basically saying they want to view the bodies, but uh, the government is basically saying that wouldn't be in the best interest we're talking about uh, state mortuaries in Nigeria that are uh, in not uh, a, a great condition. And we're talking about bodies that have been in, this, in these facilities uh, for more than two, um, uh, months. two months. So we're talking about a state, uh, uh, you know, bodies that are severely uh, uh, decomposed. So it would be very difficult to add that uh, emotion and that devastation to already a pain that has been felt over the past uh, 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 two months. So the South African government saying, look, let's not go there. Uh, a bone of contention, there seems to have been somewhat an agreement with uh, uh, the, the, these families that certainly that viewing will not take place here. Well, Chriselda Lewis, Chriselda Lewis and I will of course be bringing you um, this ceremony live from here, Vatatkluf um, Air Force Base, where Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa will be giving that keynote address um, a little later on. Uh, of course, a little earlier, I did speak to uh, Pastor Wiseman Racine Nebuso, who is, of course, the second in charge at, uh, at TB Joshua's church. He will be telling us, I did ask him um, why T.B. Joshua uh, didn't find it proper uh, to perhaps come here today um, himself and uh, pay his respects. Uh, we're not at all suggesting that he is responsible um, for what went on on that fateful day, but uh, at the very least we thought it would be one of the best ways he could pay tribute um, to these people was to come here himself um, today and pay his respects. I did uh, have that conversation with Pastor Busso. Um, uh, we will be bringing it to you in a short while. We did also to speak to some of the local elders um, of the church about the role of the church and what they have done to alleviate the suffering um, of the families, even though uh, they will not be bringing back their bodies. Let's bring you uh, now that interview uh, that I had a short while ago, about five minutes ago or so, with uh, Pastor Buso. This is how that interview went. Pastor, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Tevela, as well. Um, you are the second in charge um, in the church. If you can just take us through very briefly in, um, through what the role of the church has been in this particular, uh, is going to be in this particular ceremony. Oh, point of correction, we are a delegation. <laughs> and second, the prophet has sent us here. We are first and foremost here on behalf of all the partners of Emmanuel TV all over the world, yes. on behalf of the people of God and the Prophet himself, to thank the government of South Africa for the honor given to all those involved in this incident. To let you know that the Prophet is praying for you, his heart, his mind, his prayer is for the people of Africa and for those involved, and ensure that the government of Africa will go from strength to strength, in Jesus' name. Second, the man of God, as you know, is a man of faith, is a man of prayer. 
you know thousands that are actually in the church today looking for Jesus for salvation and all his heart is to bring people for salvation. I can let you know he's absent in the body but present in the spirit. Could he not have come himself today? If you go to Emmanuel TV now, you will see the thousands all over the world came to meet him. Sick people, afflicted people. As the martyrs, they came to look for Jesus. First, they came for Jesus. And as a servant of God, he's here to attend to them. That's why he couldn't come here. He sent us here on his behalf. So thank you. Well, this is a tragedy um, that doesn't happen every day. One would have thought, at the very least, on this particular occasion, that he would have sacrificed everything and perhaps come here. Well, I can tell you that the prophet has said that he will come at God's appointed time when the Spirit of God directs him. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever he does, he receives instruction from heaven. All I know, he said it from the memory of the martyrs of faith. He said he would come to South Africa and you will see him and it will be a big blessing. Thank you. But you don't know when. As I said, he's a prophet led by God. But he said when the God will release him, he'll be here. Um, just a bit of clarity um, with regard to the inquiry. Um, is um, uh, T.B. Joshua going to um, go and testify before the inquiry? I can say much investigation is going on. And as I told you that if he's invited as a man of faith, as a good citizen, he will respond. At God's point in time. Thank you so much. Dr. Tabela, if I may come to you very briefly. Um, in our previous um, conversations, you, um, of course, did tell us that the church um, was going to give the families support. Uh, how far has that process gone? It has gone too far. Almost everybody has been given a, a kind of support right now, as so we speak. Uh, we have announced uh, that there will be some sort of, uh, of appreciations in terms of the, of the burials all the families that are affected, those who seek help, we've agreed that we, we have already uh, touched them, we are going to give, uh, uh, offer them those kind of uh, help on the burials. Is it, is it going to start and end with the burials or beyond it's, it's, the funerals? Are you going to give any form of support to the uh, families? We, are, we, have, we have done already with the analysis. Uh, for all the families, we know their needs. Once the burial is, is over, we'll be sitting with them again and identify the, the correctness of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of what they need. And we'll go beyond that and help. Some will be issue of school fees, some will be scholarships, going to universities, and all sorts of things. That has been done already. We are going to be going to that level after the funerals. Dr. Tebela, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Dr. Tim Tebela, of course, is uh, an elder from uh, the church. Um, he speaking to us earlier was uh, uh, Pastor Wiseman Rasin Bu who is, of course, the second in charge um, there where Dr. T.B. Joshua is the pastor. Well, thanks. Well, uh, Wiseman Rasin Busso, the second in charge in TB Joshua's uh, church. Apologies there, said doctor, is not. Um, now, if I may go back now to our studio where we